Hey, it's Sam. And John. And you can watch new episodes of our latest podcast, OKOP, where we tell the funniest freaking stories on the internet. Like someone making billions off a of plane RuneScape? Oh, who make those Bitcoin billies. Or the doctor accidentally putting the mistress as the emergency contact instead of the wife. Hey, yo, that sounds like a family feud. Do not tell Steve Harvey. But the point is, we got some bangers. Yes, so if you want to laugh and occasionally cringe, listen now for free wherever you get your podcasts. The Reynolds Aluminum Program with Fibber McGee and Molly. The Reynolds Metals Company, makers of Reynolds Aluminum, presents Fibber McGee and Molly transcribed with Bill Thompson, Arthur Q. Bryan, Dick LeGrand, Gil Stratton Jr., Herb Vigren, and me, Harlow Wilcox. The show is written by Phil Leslie and Keith Fowler and directed by Max Hutto with music by the Kingsmen and Billy Mills Orchestra. Now, as once more, we open the windows of 79 Wistful Vista, so of course, the most beautifully finished windows, I think, that have ever been offered. In the great Reynolds line, there is most every kind of window you might want for your home. Casement windows, the vertical kind that open out, opening wide at the hinges so you can clean any pane from inside the house. Reynolds aluminum awning windows with horizontal panels that open out at an angle, to deflect rain and give you draft-free ventilation. And the familiar double-hung type. Only so much better in Reynolds aluminum that never rusts, never warps, never needs painting. See them at your dealers. Windows are among the many products made better with Reynolds aluminum. Have you read a story called How I Killed the Giant Grizzly in Partly True magazine? (laughs) You haven't. Well, Mr. McGee hasn't either, but he's been trying to read it for the past half hour. As we join Fibber McGee and Molly. I just got this copy of Partly True magazine downtown, Molly, and if I can just sit here quietly and read my story. All right. Read, dearie. I've got things to do, anyhow. Good. Now, no, let me see now. What's the name of the story? It's a true adventure, and it's called How I Killed the Giant Grizzly by Trapper Joe. Nobody has given me a chance to read it yet. Well, you just got home two minutes ago. I tried to read it on the streetcar, too. But more Toop sat down next to me and started yakking politics, trying to get me to switch my vote. <laughs> Which side is Mort on, Democrat or Republican? Well, I forget now, but it was the wrong side, as usual. <laughs> I let him sound off first so I could see which way he was leaning, you know. Just because I took the other side, he started an argument. (laughs) Who won it? Nobody. I finally rolled the magazine up, slapped him over the head with it, and got off the car six blocks before our house and walked home. (laughs) Good for you. You know, walking away from a political argument is awfully good for the teeth, they tell me. The teeth? Yeah, it keeps you from having to pick them up off the sidewalk. (laughs) But I'm chattering here too much. You go ahead and read, dearie. Good. This story looks wonderful. Listen how it starts out, Molly. It says, When I first saw the giant grizzly, he was walking along the mountaintop with a bull moose over his shoulder. With a what? A bull moose. You know, that's a kind of a large elk. They they come from up north. Say, Hmm? Uncle Dennis knew an elk from Seattle. (laughs) You don't suppose that... No, no, no. Anyhow, it says, with a bull moose over his shoulder, while under his arm, the giant grizzly carried the lifeless body of my faithful horse, Charlie. Who was this written by, Baron Munchausen? No, oh, no, it's by Trapper Joe. He's a trapper. He's trapped you, I can see that. <laughs> Leave me read it, will you? It says, I knew that someday I would a huge creature in a fight to the death. This great monster whom the Indians call by the name of Waka Nemo, which in the Indian language means... You shoot him, bud. Me scram. That's mighty fragrant writing, dear. Oh, this guy can really write on account of because he knows. Hey, daughter. Hey, Johnny. Did you hear the news? Did you hear? Did you hear? Huh? What? Well, what is it, Mr. Oldtimer? Somebody set fire to the city hall. Fire to the city hall? What? When? When did it happen? 1862. They oh. think Stoney Jackson's been done it. Oh. <laughs> oh, for the love of... I just read about it, Johnny. Oh, I love history. So long, kid. My goodness, that was a fast little visit Yeah, darn him anyhow, lost my place now 
Now, a bull moose over his shoulder. I beg your pardon for rushing off so abrupt, kids, but I gotta run and tell Bessie. She loves history, too. Excuse me. <laughs> rat that dead rat. Now, where was I? Oh. As I prepared to stalk the giant grizzly who had slain my faithful Charlie horse, or... <laughs> Horse Charlie, the faithful pal, <laughs> the faithful pal of my faithful saddle days, I knew. Now it starts. Now it starts. Did you ever see it to fail? You talk to him, Molly. I'm going to read this story if it's the last thing. Come in. Hello there, old man. Mm. Well, good day, missus. Hello, McGee. Hi. I knew that someday I would face this frightful monster. Well, he's reading a story, Ollie. And avenge the death of my faithful pal. My old horse, Charlie. Does he always read out loud, missus? Why, certainly I read out loud. My gosh, how would you read? Well, don't get excited, McGee. Most people read to themselves. Well, I'm reading to myself, but gee whiz, I want to hear what I'm reading, don't I? <laughs> this is a terrific story, boy. How I Killed the Giant Grizzly by Trapper Joe. And if Joe traps like he writes, he must get mighty hungry. <laughs> this is the kind of a story that every guy wishes he'd done it himself. <clears throat> you ever hunt bear, Ollie? No, I always hunt with the clothes on. <laughs> That's a yoke, McGee. <laughs> yoke my clavicle. That's a whole egg. <laughs> Don't tell me about yokes, boy. I and Fred Nittany, the guy that me and him had a subaudible act together from Starved Rock, Illinois together, invented that joke out of a book we found stuffed in a hole in a baseboard in a little hole in the wall in East Shingle House, Pennsylvania. Before the Johnstown flood. Read the story, McGee. I used to talk to your missus. We got a letter this week, missus, from our boy Lars in the Navy. Oh, fine, Ollie. How's the lad getting along? Oh, Lars makes out very good, missus. He sails with the submarines now, it says. Yeah? Riding around on a submarine, eh? On submarines, McGee, you don't ride on them. You get down in a submarine so you don't get wet. <laughs> They're little black boats that go under the water. I know. That the whole fleet was having practice last week, and one of them tornadoes blew up and just missed the boat. <laughs> you mean a torpedo? Yeah, one of those big round winds full of barns and trees and stuff. Yeah. So it blows down off the coast. Oh, well, that is a tornado, Ollie. Well, McGee, you said it was a torpedo. Well, I thought you meant a torpedo. I said tornado. <laughs> you said Lars is on a submarine and a tornado blew up. Them things they shoot off of submarines are called torpedoes. Was you ever in the Navy, McGee? Never. Well, I was. In the First World War, I was on a Swedish submarine. We had a captain that was a lot like you. Well, when you were out on practice, what was it the captain shot off? His big fat mouth. So long. <laughs> Billy Mills in the orchestra and meet Mr. Callahan.
I packed my gear to take the trail after the giant grizzly who had killed my faithful horse, Charlie. Hey, how's the story coming, dear? Is it good? The part I've read seven times is good, yes. <laughs> if people would just leave me alone a while so I could enjoy... Well, now go ahead and read it, sweetheart. I won't talk to you. Good. Let's see, where was I? Oh. As I packed my gear for this dangerous trip... I... Ah, for the... Come in. Oh, it's the lad from Kramer's Drugstore, McGee. Come in, Ed. Hello, Mrs. McGee. I brought the nail polish and stuff you ordered. Hi, Mr. McGee. Thank you, Ed. Hi, Ed. We haven't seen you lately, Ed. How have you and little Debbie Lynn been getting along, all right? Her? Miss Lynn and I are no longer an item, Mrs. McGee. Oh, really? I was quite fond of Deborah, but I felt that she conducted herself in a manner this summer that I was justified in taking back my union button. <laughs> yeah? My gosh, what'd she do, Ed? Got married. <laughs> well, you've done right, boy. Don't let him take advantage of you. I suppose you were pretty broken up, Ed. Yeah, I couldn't sleep for a couple of days, Mrs. McGee. But then, Carolyn. Carolyn, huh? Yeah, the girl who moved in across the hall. Gee, I can't even sleep nights since I met Carolyn. Yeah. <laughs> Just thinking about her keeps you awake, huh? No, it's her trombone playing. Oh. <laughs> she practices half the night. Heavenly days, a lady trombone player. Oh, it's a problem, all right. Yeah. We've been gone together for two weeks now, and, well... Last night, I asked for a kiss. What'd she say? Said she's saving her lips for the trombone. <laughs> well, don't let it throw you, Ed. Maybe she'll get married, too. Now, uh, if you've got to get back to work, i am uh, got a story here I'm trying to read. Trying Was it to read. a good story? Oh, it's terrific, I think. It's called How I Killed a Giant Grizzly. Wrote by a guy named Trapper Joe. He's a great hunter. Uh, you go hunting, don't you, Ed? Oh, sure, Mrs. McGee. I love to hunt quail and ducks. You ever hunt bear, Ed? No, sir, just with my clothes on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good one, huh? <laughs> Only down at the Elks Club told me yeah, that joke. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ed. Yes, sir? You ought to pick your friends a little more carefully, son. <laughs> You go around repeating all these jokes, and you'll be a social outcast. Well, that's funny. When I told Mr. Kramer that one, he laughed so hard he busted his money belt. <laughs> well, i got to get back now and help him sweep up the nickels. Bye now. Goodbye, Ed. After the giant grizzly, the thought of my faithful horse spurred me on. And armed only with my faithful bowie knife and two faithful elephant guns and a faithful Winchester... I hit the faithful trail. Hello, the... Molly. Hi, pal. Oh, hello, Mr. Wilcox. Oh, hi, Junior. Hey, what are you reading, pal? Well, I'm trying to... Is that the new Reynolds booklet that tells all about Reynolds' aluminum irrigation pipe? Oh, no, Mr. Wilcox. That's just The free little... book that you get just by writing irrigation on a postcard and mailing it to Reynolds Metals Company, Louisville 1, Kentucky. Great book. Junior, this is not a book. It's a magazine. The story I've been trying to read for the past two hours is called How I Killed a Giant Grizzly. And oh, a, a bear, huh? Yes, a bear. Hey, you know, my aunt had quite an experience with a bear one time. Oh, really, Mr. Wilcox? Don't encourage him. <laughs> well, it happened on their farm. Oh? Yeah. Uh, you know my uncle, Big Bottomland Wilcox. <laughs> one who has the farm out past Dugan's Lake. <laughs> I never heard of it. Well... <laughs> He's got this big farm out there, you see. Yeah. And being a very progressive guy and a very smart farmer, he's always alert to ways of making more income per acre. Yeah, but about the bear, Junior, you said Actually, the bear... it was his wife who had the trouble with the bear. Oh? Yeah. You see, Uncle Big Bottom Land, being interested in getting more income out of his farm, mm -hmm. naturally uses aluminum irrigation systems every place. Yeah, but what they've got to do with Portable, the bear? portable systems. The bear? No, portable systems made with Reynolds aluminum irrigation pipe. Oh. Because aluminum pipe is rust-proof. And it's a light. You can move it around from field to field, you yes, see. Yes, but what about your aunt, Mr. Wilcox? Yes. Oh, my aunt can move it, too, Molly. Oh. <laughs> see, it weighs practically nothing. The thing about a portable irrigation system is you can shift it around from field to field, so it gives you water where you need it and when you need it. Well, this story I'm trying to read is about a giant bear. That's that... how it happened, all right. <laughs> Aunt Clara was moving the portable irrigation system down to the lower field because Uncle Big Bottomland knew he could double and even triple his crop yield with a Reynolds irrigation system when, all at once, up came this bear. Oh, my goodness, a real one? Big black bear, about eight feet tall. Big bear. Aunt Clara grabbed up a length of pipe and belted him over the head with it. Wow. 
But the bear just snickered at her. What do you mean? Because, of course, a 20-foot length of aluminum irrigation pipe only weighs about seven pounds. It's not much good for killing bears. Hmm. Heavenly days. Well, what'd she do? How did it turn out? Well, it turned out he was a dancing bear from the circus, Molly. So Aunt Clara put on a Guy Lombardo recording of Sweet George Brown, and he just did a slow Charleston till the men came and got him. Go <laughs> on, Chad. Don't say anything. Don't say anything. <laughs> With my faithful Indian guide beside me, I set out to track the giant grizzly. Sweetheart, before you start on the story again, what would you like me to fix for dinner? Uh, oh, anything, kiddo, anything. Just just let me read. All it? right, dearie. Just trying to please my lord and master. Good. I know. I'll fix some of my special hamburgers, and you can bring your magazine to the table and read right through dinner, sweetheart. How's that? Oh, fine, fine, great. Listen to this. This is dynamite, Molly. It says, as my guide and I rounded the cliff... We suddenly came face to face with the giant grizzly. Hunting bear, were they? <laughs> no, they had... all oh, cut it out. <laughs> and in a flash, the huge monster charged us. Dropping my gun, I turned to my faithful Indian guide and said, Dinko Bongo Wan Panyan, which in the Indian language means, give me a boost up this spruce, Bruce. <laughs> Well, did uh, Bruce give him a boost? I guess not. It says, The answering voice of my faithful Indian guide, Bruce, floated down to me from the topmost branch of the 60-foot spruce. <laughs> As he said, Waka Nemo, which means... You shoot him, bud, and he scram. <laughs> did you read this? Oh. <laughs> this, is, this is the best part. No, no, no. Don't answer it, Molly. Don't answer it. But, McGee, we can't... Ignore it. Let it ring. It's Dr. Gamble, McGee. Now, put oh. the magazine down. I won't let you be impolite to the doctor. Come in. Oh, that's big. Hello, Dr. Gamble. Do come in. Well, thank you, Molly. And a pleasant late afternoon to you, dull skull. <laughs> Hi, wide sides. <laughs> I'd ask you to sit down, but you're the type guy that you'd just be dirty enough to do it. <laughs> You're sweet, son, and I'm happy to accept your kind invitation to pile my weary freight into a chair. Yeah. <sighs> it feels good to sit. You look tired, Doctor. Rough day? Rougher than sandpaper pants, Molly. <laughs> Started the day off by losing a patient at 7 o'clock this morning. Oh, no. Oh, gee, that's tough, Doc. Oh, we found him again at quarter of 8. They took him to the wrong hospital. <laughs> Is it anyone we know, Doctor? Yeah, Officer Cleary's little boy, Molly. Oh, they brought him in for a whistleectomy. A what electomy? Whistleectomy. The lad swallowed his father's traffic whistle last night. Oh. Oh my goodness, was he suffering much? No, but everybody else was. Seems yeah. he got the hiccups. He got the hiccups at Fourteenth and Oak and loused up traffic for three blocks. <laughs> Boy, you get everything, don't you, Fatso? Everything but money. <laughs> Well, now, you just sit here and relax, Doctor. I've got to get dinner started. Well, say, no. Why don't you stay and eat with us? Oh, oh no, I really shouldn't. No, he really shouldn't, Molly. His no. housekeeper probably expects him to Oh, she's out of town. Mm. No, I'll just go down to Walt's malt shop like a lonely old man. Well, now, you just have dinner with us. Now, let's change the subject. If you're sure I won't be imposing, Not Molly. Not a bit. Glad to have you. I'm just having hamburgers and french fries, if you don't mind. Your special hamburgers? Yes. Oh, Molly, you've just made your kindly old physician very happy. Fine. As long as you don't mind taking potluck. Don't mind taking potluck? Ha! Huh. It's this kind of luck that gave him that pot in the first place. <laughs> Give me your hat and overcoat, fatso. I know when I'm licked. The King's Men and me and Marie. You are the sea little me and Marie by the old seaside. By the ocean we set and we pet and we pet till we get swept out by the tide. You may have been to Coney. By the old seaside, by the ocean we set and we pet and we pet till we get swept out by the tide. You may have been to Coney and kept both of your eyes open wide, but 
Just wonderful, Molly. I must have had five or six of them. You had seven. Did I really? Of course not, Doctor. McGee had seven. Well, I wondered if You I... had eight. Oh. <laughs> well, thanks again, Molly, and good night, both of you. Good night. Come back again. My gosh, I thought that guy'd never go. Lock that door. Turn out the lights. I'll take my magazine. I'll go down in the basement. I'll light a candle. I'll be a son of a gun. <laughs> What's the matter? I can't find my magazine. Where <laughs> Anybody home? <laughs> oh, it sounds like Mr. Wimple. Quick, where's my magazine? I'll sneak up to the attic with it. Hush, dearie. We're in the living room, Mr. Wimple. Come on through. Hello, folks. Hi, Wimp. I hope you didn't mind my coming in the back way. Oh, no. I sneaked up the alley because, well, she is looking for me. Gee, uh, you mean... Uh... Yes. Sweetie Face, my big old wife. <laughs> Where'd I put that magazine, Molly? You know where I I'll put it. I'll find it for you in a minute, dearie. Are you in trouble, Mr. Wilson? Oh, Wimple? oh, not really, Mrs. McGee. Uh, Sweetie Face and I had a little political discussion after dinner, and oh, she was just in a snit. <laughs> Upset, eh? Yes. She was making a speech at the Italian American Ballots and Meatballs Club this afternoon, <laughs> and somebody in the front row started to heckle her. The poor foolish fellow. <laughs> Made her angry, did it? Yes. She just reached over and slugged him on the head with the first thing she could get her hands on. Mm, what was that? Me. <laughs> wow. This darned election makes her so nervous. Yeah? She just sits in front of the fireplace for hours, tying and untying knots in the poker. <laughs> well, I guess everybody will be glad when the election is over, Wimp. But right now, I'm reading a magazine, as soon as I can remember where I put it. So, if I can find my magazine... I even wrote a poem about it, Mr. McGee. About a magazine? No, about the election. Oh. Would you care to hear it? Oh, I don't know. We'd love to, Mr. Wimple. Mm. An election poem, eh? Yes. It's dedicated to both passion times. I lay those ball backs down, boys. <laughs> oh, I like that. That's nice. Thank you. Mm. Election time. <clears throat> the air is full of angry cries and slurs and dirty names. Whatever grief the country has, each side the other blames. The donkeys claim the elephants are very foolish thinkers. The elephant says the donkey boys are just a bunch of clinkers. <laughs> While prophets all predict our fall, should their side wind up losing, the voter stands head in his hands. The whole thing so confusing. Twas ever thus, twill ever be. But this we can remember. The USA will still be here. No matter who wins in November. <laughs> Thank you and good night. Well, it's good. Lock that door, Molly. Where's the magazine? You seen it? Well, I think you dropped it on the floor by your chair there, didn't you? No, it's not there. Doggone it, I left Trapper Joe standing in front of a 60-foot spruce tree with a giant grizzly charger. Hey, maybe I put it on the buffet. I ain't here. I ain't here. Tell him I, I wonder if I put that magazine in the kitchen. 79 Whistle Vista, Molly McGee speaking. Oh, hello, Dr. Gamble. Well, we loved having you. How's that, Doctor? Oh, gone it. I couldn't have took it upstairs. Oh, sure, Doctor. I'll tell him. Yes, that's okay. Good night. Uh, what does he want? He wants me to run over there and bring him another hamburger to take to bed no, with him. No, no, he just called to tell you he picked up a magazine off of the coffee table, and he hopes you don't mind. What? He says there's a wonderful story in it. How huh? I Killed a Giant Grizzly by Trapper Joe. What? Says you ought to read it. What? <laughs> Why, that rat. 
That dirty double-crosser. Eats our food and steals my magazine. Oh! That's big, fat old pile. McGee, on. stop kicking the furniture. Uh, now stop it. Uh, my goodness, if the story is that important, why don't you run down to the all-night newsstand uh, and get another copy? I can't get another copy. That magazine is four years old. What? I picked it up this afternoon in Doc Gamble's waiting room. <laughs> Fibber and Molly return in a moment. You know, they say it's hard to find household help today, but that depends. We offer to all of you the best and brightest household help anybody ever hired. It's Reynolds Wrap, the original and genuine, the pure aluminum foil in handy rolls. What a kitchen maid this is. No more scouring for you. Just line your broiler pans and baking dishes with Reynolds Wrap. They stay clean. No oven tending either. Just roast your meat or poultry in Reynolds Wrap. And the juices are sealed in. No wasteful shrinkage, no burning. And your refrigerator. Why, with everything wrapped or covered with Reynolds Wrap, you don't have to clean out wilted leftovers. You save food, save work. Stock up on Reynolds Wrap at your grocer's. He has the new jumbo economy rolls, 75 feet, as well as the standard 25-foot rolls. Ask for Reynolds Wrap, made by the Reynolds Metals Company, one of America's great producers of aluminum. is election day. You know what gets me about election day? What? The people. The way people let other people pick the people to run the people's country for them. Oh, well, I think what you're trying to say, dearie, is for everybody to please be sure and vote next Tuesday. Whoever your choice is, vote. You betcha. Ladies and gentlemen, look. The man we choose next Tuesday is going to run your country for you for the next four years. Now, are you going to sit back and let somebody else hire him for you? Of course they are, dearie. Don't get so excited. Well, who's excited? I just want everybody to vote, that's all. Get down to them polls and sound off. Because if you don't vote next Tuesday, don't start beefing Wednesday morning. That's all I got to say. Good night. Good night, Al. The Reynolds Metals Company, pioneers of progress through aluminum, brings you Fibber McGee and Molly each week at this time. Reynolds Aluminum also brings you Mr. Peepers, starring Wally Cox on NBC television Sunday nights. See your local paper for time and channel. And be sure to be with us again next Tuesday night. Good night. The preceding was transcribed. Tonight, play Two for the Money with Herb Schreiner on NBC.